My name is Michael Zantowski. I'm the ambassador of the Czech Republic in the UK, and I have a panel of distinguished academics and politicians and scholars to uh, pronounce on the politics and history of uh, Central Europe over the last 100 years. And, uh, and I think the timing for this is very opportune if uh, somewhat by accident, I will try to explain what I mean. Uh, we started with the keynote speech in the morning on the uh, historicist approach to uh, Central and uh, Eastern Europe. We continued uh, with the culture panel, which in many conferences will be the last panel. And uh, then uh, we swapped the politics panel for the economics panel, so we come before economics. And, uh, and all, of a, all of a sudden it started looking to me like, a, uh, like the right progression. We who grew up in, in the communist system, uh, you will remember that we were <coughs> taught and indoctrinated in the spirit of what used to be called uh, historic determinism or materialism, that it's the production forces of the society that will determine everything else, that uh, the economy comes before politics and politics comes before the unimportant things like culture and, uh, and, and so on. And as Marx put it, uh, being precedes consciousness. And this is a thesis that was famously rejected by uh, my former president and friend Václav Havel in his speech to uh, the joint session of the United States Congress in which he said it's not true that uh, being precedes consciousness is the other way around. Consciousness precedes being. So we start with uh, history, culture, we get to politics, and we end up with you know, unimportant things like economy. <laughs> so, what I see at the moment is two concepts of democracy. Uh, basically, in shorthand, one says democracy is about popular sovereignty. The other one says, no, no, democracy is about liberal values. Um, you can argue that liberalism, which I think is a quite extraordinary strength in the minds of an elite, uh, I would argue that this is a reality-defining elite using the term popularized by Peter Berger. Uh, I will do the occasional verbal footnote just to show that I'm still an academic person. It has three components to my mind. There's social liberalism, economic liberalism, and political liberalism. It seems to me that at this particular time, the first two, that's to say social and economic liberalism, are hegemonic. Uh, political liberalism, I think, places the emphasis on popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty means that the Grundnorm, when push comes to shove, at the end of the day, the ultimate power rests with the electorate, society, the people, whichever of these terms, even the consumers, whichever of these terms you want to use. Um, this is strongly contested by uh, the liberal uh, perspective which says no, that takes you towards majoritarianism, where minorities suffer all sorts of oppression. One step on it pushes you into all sorts of collectivist, possibly organic concepts of society, and eventually ethnicity, nationalism, and only one step from that towards Nazism. Uh, the slide is quite often almost invisible, but I think it's real, and I think that the fear that if uh, popular sovereignty is not checked, not controlled uh, in some form or other, then there's a kind of historical necessity, I think you've just used that term, uh, is going to push us in the direction of some kind of nasty dictatorship. Now, I have serious problems with this. It seems to me that well, my ideal, we all have ideals, even at my advanced advanced years, my ideal is that there should be an equilibrium, a balance between popular sovereignty and the liberal values, and in certain circumstances, the liberal values have to give way to popular sovereignty. 
always assuming that the classical division of powers, etc., the classical institutions of democracy, I'm referring clearly here to the 19th century classics, uh, Mill and Tocqueville. I don't know, do any of you know the work, the work of Franz Lieber, Francis Lieber, a little known German American? Commend him to your attention. He is very strong on institutions as the safeguard for democracy. Um, he went to the United States in the 1820s, I think. He was there during the Civil War. Um, and in a way, if I'm right, and I think well, certainly this is what I knew in the European Parliament, that there has been a, a massive shift towards liberal values away from popular sovereignty, then my question is, it's a rhetorical question, uh, is there still a social contract? Is there still a social contract between rulers and rule? And if so, what is the nature of feedback? Can you have democracy without feedback? Um, so what we're actually looking at, and I'm taking this term from Zygmunt Bauman, is the rise of the legislating intellectual. Moral legislation, uh, in, uh, an elite which defines a set of moral norms, what is right, what is wrong, what kind of behavior brings about punishment, brings about reward, issues of this kind. Um, and it seems to me that the liberalism, as captured by uh, these intellectuals, has acquired a critical mass. Um, this greatly strengthens the moral legislative capacity. I think it enhances the group cohesion. You might say it is brought about an echo chamber. Uh, and is, in many ways, tantamount to a ground shared hegemony. It's very difficult to argue against it. It's the cohesion element. It's discursive, but very difficult to have Habermas's uh, discursive democracy if the other side doesn't listen. And that's been certainly my experience, that there are certain norms, certain propositions, even certain kinds of language <coughs> that are simply not possible to challenge. Uh, there's no response. Very, very interesting psychologically. If any of you read in social psychology, then you know what I'm talking about. And I think it, this is the point where I can reasonably quote Isaiah Berlin. Uh, his work is always worth going back to. The great monistic ideologies, he obviously fascism and communism in mind, <laughs> attempted to deal uh, with the great complex questions of life. What is life about? What is it ontology, if you like? By obliterating them. And I have this fear that what passes for liberalism today, and I think it's dynamic, it's stronger than it was 15, 20 years ago, is in serious danger of doing something analogous, which means that choices will be narrow, which has all sorts of other implications, which I don't have time to go, to, go into. <coughs> now, the next point I want to talk about is how this impacts on central Europe. But here we're looking at uh, transition. Go back 20, 25 years, and it's not that transition is a kind of uh, total all-round concept of movement towards democracy. It's a very particular concept of democracy that the former communist countries were, if you like, obliged to accept. Obliged in the sense that there really weren't many alternatives around. Actually, there weren't genuinely many alternatives around. And democracy in 1990, whichever you want to choose, was a very different animal from what it had been in the 1950s. The proposition that the market solves everything was already very strong. And if you read the literature uh, of those who dealt with uh, the Western advisors, you can actually see uh, that there was very little local agency. Uh, region in Weddellsburg, very, very interesting on this topic. Now, my sense of it is that transition sort of implied, and implied I think is the right word, a kind of informal contract, uh, an international or transnational social contact, contract between the West and the Central Europe that was joining the West, that the terms of the membership would not be modified uh, significantly, but I think that they have. Uh, the rise of Giddens' third world New liberalism, I haven't had a good word for this yet, um, really altered the provisions. And I do not think that the former communist states, by now newly democratic states, were in a position to make an input into that. Whatever they said was simply pushed to one side. 
Um, this is what, with some minor modifications, these former communist states were obliged to accept as they joined the European Union. Those of you who have looked closely at these things will know that there were exceptions. For example, the Estonians have an exception that they don't have to protect beavers. There are lots of beavers in southern Estonia. And they don't have the same strict regulation. So that's the level at which exceptions were possible. Uh, in other words, in any of the serious areas, let's not see. Let's not be uh, naive. No, the Hungarian case study, it seems to me, is the study of resistance. It's questioning the basis of market liberalism. If you look at the European Union, if you look at the international economic community, it's fixated on the market is always right. Market equilibrium will solve everything. Um, I'm very, very interested, once we have some perspective on the Barroso Commission, how committed it was to market liberalism. I think the Juncker Commission is doing it somewhat differently, but too early to judge. Um, so, those of you who have been following uh, the Hungarian story will know about unorthodox economic strategy, um, which has actually worked surprisingly well. We've got a sort of 3% growth this year, have had quite a reasonable growth figure last year. Um, taxing foreign investors, there's the new constitution, much reviled. Um, a transfrontier concept of cultural nationhood that is seen to question the citizenship of other states, neighboring states. Um, and then, of course, Prime Minister Orban celebrated illiberalism. Now, uh, have a look at the video, as I did. Uh, have a look at the text. It's all there in English. And you will see that it's actually not a kind of universal illiberalism. It's a specifically focused illiberalism to do with the economics. It's a, it's a, it's really, if he had attacked neoliberalism, I think the problem wouldn't have arisen. He, however, did say liberalism, and that started red lights flashing all over Europe. Um, in terms of public relations, it's a disaster. Uh, it's impossible to defend. Who's going to be an illiberalist? It's like asking a six-year-old boy, are you going to be a dictator when you grow up? No, nobody's going to be. Everyone's a democrat, so nobody's an illiberal. What kind of society, which feeds into my argument here, what kind of a society is Hungarian society? It seems to me that it's a deeply segmented society. If it weren't for the fact that we all spoke Hungarian, we would be different ethnic groups, certainly different linguistic groups. I exaggerate, but only slightly, that there are left-wing restaurants and right-wing restaurants in Budapest. It's better outside, outside Budapest. More importantly, uh, part one of the segments, the center-left segment, functions as a comprador intelligentsia. I'm using comprador in the sense that Marx used it. It's a transmission basically undigested of Western ideas, Western concepts. It's a translator. Um, doesn't attempt to uh, adapt what is coming, what it's seen as coming from the West to Hungarian conditions, but to impose. And at that point, of course, it ties in very well with this reality-defining elite that it sees itself as a part of uh, in the world. Um, it questions the outcome of elections. So in other words, it does question popular sovereignty. It tends to be value-based rather than evidence-based. That's another central problem of our age. Um, so in a way, what we're looking at in Hungary, Hungary illustrates this very well. This is not, it's not a uniquely Hungarian problem, although it has its own Hungarian dimension is a hyper-acute differentiation uh, with different reality-defining agencies, contest, extreme language. If you look throughout Europe, you will find analogues of this. They're not identical. Think of the uh, Front National in France. Think of Beppe Grillo in Italy, the Cinque Stelle. Think of the Alternative for Deutschland, Herr Wilders in the Netherlands. The, tr the true Finns who are no longer true, they're just Finn. Um, um, the Volker Party in them. I mean, there's a long, long list. Obviously, Podemos and Syriza are in this, except that they are on the left rather than the right. Hungary, I think, with Jobbik, which, as you all know, has just won a by-election, um, embodies many of these as trends, these, these currents, um, and crucially, embodies what I see as the contest between the two concepts of democracy that I sketched at the outset. Um, the nature of the, the resistance to transformation, the current state of opposition between universalism and particularism, 
And above all, I suppose, illustrates the different discursive fields which are constructed to create legitimacy in one's own political field. Thank you for your attention. I have to admit that I was uh, moved uh, rereading again the inaugural lecture by Thomas Masaryk here in London, so at the beginning I will return to it. In his memorable speech delivered at the inauguration of this school 100 years ago, Thomas Masaryk couldn't show the audience a good map of the European nations. It didn't exist at this time. On that map, he saw a peculiar zone of what is called Central Europe, a zone of a greater number of smaller nations under the dominion of Germany, Austria, Turkey, and Russia. It was here when the present war broke out, he said, and it is this zone of unrest and disturbance for the whole of Europe, where smaller nations are continually striving and fighting for liberty and independence. Masaryk proposed a solution remodeling of the political organization of Europe. If this horrible war with its countless victims has any meaning, it can only be found in the liberation of the small nations. And in his article published in the Slavonic Review in the year 1922, under the title, The Slavs After the War, he went even further. He saw the nations of Europe devoted to solidarity and unity. He believed the United States of Europe are developing, and even if this new Europe will develop slowly and piecemeal, demanding thought and effort, it has good chance. Uh, all nations will draw closer together. Disputed questions will everywhere be settled by agreement without rules. Well, indeed, the political organization of Europe has been remodeled repeatedly. The map required by Masaryk has been created and redrawn, first in the direction expressed 10 years after Masaryk's speech in 1925 by Edward Benesch in his lecture where he saw, I'm quoting again, modern constitutionalism, respect for political social equality, and for full modern political democracy. And later, this map was brutally shaped by dictators and autocrats, by Hitler and Stalin, by Khrushchev and Brezhnev, to be challenged by freedom-loving nations and leaders with the help of Europeans and <coughs> American Democrats to be followed by the most recent aggressive change authored by Vladimir Putin. From the century that has passed in Masaryk's prophetic and visionary lecture, we came here today to discuss the more fortunate period, the last quarter of it. I will try to do it using Slovakia as an example, rather in a series of snapshots I will now resign on theoretical explanations or concepts. First, and interestingly enough, this conference takes place in the middle of two history timelines. During the last century, Slovakia has undergone unusually dramatic developments, six forms of state government, three political systems, and within them several regimes uh, has taken hold on this territory. And at this time, right now, the ratio of non-democratic to democratic regimes has even out. For approximately one half of this period, the inhabitants of Slovakia lived under authoritarian, at times even totalitarian conditions, and spent the other half, by contrast, in times of greater freedom. The more, more favorable view envisions Slovakia as a successful country that has experienced setbacks and failures, but managed to pick itself up again, to reinvent itself, to stand up after falling down, and to remove them. The other side sees the situation as a glass half empty. Slovakia suffers from an ineffective state bureaucracy, widespread bribery, and problematic judicial conduct. A network of public institutions has been put in place, but some of them are not infused with authentically democratic content, and too often they are not occupied by genuine Democrats. Parties and leaders of nearly all political stripes have been in power at some point, and practically all, including, by the way, communists and red nationalists, have made it into the parliament mm -hmm. at least once. At the same time, many of those political parties and leaders have managed to discredit themselves. Although, says this critical view, what is lacking is an informed public debate on some issues of social, political, and economic development. Promotionalism has been widespread, 
banalization has become the rule and the promotion of the political public sphere in the Habermasian vein has been an exception. And now, in the last time, one of the crucial problems becomes the increased ownership of the media by oligarchs. Another paradox is in Slovakia's position towards the European Union. On the one hand, the majority of Slovaks believe that uh, there is positive impact of the EU on Slovakia's development. Most of Slovakia's identify with the EU, the members are, and the numbers are higher than European average. But on the other hand, Slovak participation in the elections to the European Parliament have been exceptionally low. Certainly, if we ask how people in Slovakia view their society, in almost all sociological <coughs> surveys conducted since the early 90s until now, the findings present a relatively stable pattern, with two issues dominating the list of the most pressing social problems, unemployment and declining standards of living and insufficient social security. High unemployment, uh, especially long-term unemployment, is more prevalent among the inhabitants of socially excluded localities, and this is really one of the biggest civilization challenges of Slovakia. It means the situation of Roma population. There are vivid and painful illustrations of the very substance of social exclusion, a lack of individual and group participation in the economic, political, and social life of society, a lack of access to resources, which can take economic, social, political, territorial, and symbolic dimensions. And moreover, we are witnessing increasing tensions between Roma and non-Roma in some areas. Groups of frustrated citizens are calling more frequently for the application of an iron hand. What is interesting in public opinion polls is that while people appreciate the positive aspects of the post-1898 transformation or freedoms and new opportunities, other aspects of their lives didn't give much grounds for enthusiasm. Despite individual political freedoms, only two-fifths of Slovakia citizens believe that they have a stronger influence on political decision-making now than before 1989. 25 years after the fall of communism, most people felt too weak to defend their rights and to push their interests. Only about one-third of citizens thought that they had a better chance to be successful through honest work than the generations of their parents before the Velvet Revolution. And even fewer respondents, one in four, were convinced that the quality of citizen before the law has improved in comparison with the current era. So it means more freedom doesn't immediately and automatically mean that the state of justice and quality of democracy improves. Fourthly, and there were also the several mentions of this topic, uh, we, what Slovakia has not avoided upsurge of various forms of populism that has gradually penetrated the political scene in many European countries. Uh, it's not only about uh, what usually is called as a populist zeitgeist, it is also what Ivan Krastev saw that the central Europe is the capital of this new populism. This magic formula of its success consisted of ten elements with authentic angel unrestrained heritage of the elites, declared nationalism, undeclared xenophobia, and anti-corruption rhetoric among them. And this, says Ivan Krastev, is the new electoral version of the Molotov Cocktail. Uh, fifthly, a brief snapshot looking at civil society which played an extraordinarily important role in Slovakia in a period of catching up and returning to democratic rule. Uh, we still see quite a rich, diverse, and flexible network of forms, organizations, schemes, initiatives, and ideas. It has established different forms, intellectual foundation for societal reforms, mechanisms for control of power, watchdogging, defending the interests of various groups of citizens, open forums for previously unheard voices, offering useful services, participating in resolving environmental, social, and as issues and reacted also to common needs of villages, town, communities, and villages. It is still quite good. <coughs> Policy researchers and institutes and other groups uh, were also active in a lot of advocacy initiatives, probably the most important and most known of which which was a campaign for the new Freedom of Information Act called What is Not Secret is Public, 
There were 120 NGOs and 100,000 supporters, and it is not by chance that each and every government wanted to modify this law. Great ideas and visions would help. In this regard, it is useful, I think it is useful to recall the words of Pope John II during his visit to Slovakia in 1995 in times of tensions and anxiety over democracy. He addressed a crowd of almost one million with the same simple words which he used with Poland and other countries. Don't be afraid. He said giving people faith that they were not alone, that they had the courage to stand firm and the strength to press change. And this message, in combination with the electri electrifying appeal of public against violence in the first hours of the Velvet Revolution, let us as citizens take matters into our own hands, could provide a fertile and inspiring soil for a future narrative, a narrative for a country whose citizens are able to mobilize their potential and have courage to pursue their dream to anchor Slovakia more firmly in the family of region lying through abiding nations, something what Masaryk believed decades ago. Thanks. Um, so I want to begin with uh, looking at the, just real briefly the origins of physical co cooperation. It was in February 1991 when the heads of state of Poland, uh, the Czechoslovak Republic at that time, uh, as well as uh, Hungary came together and signed the Visegrad uh, Declaration, which set uh, forward uh, the foundation for permanent cooperation of the region. Uh, it was an important uh, event because it put these four countries together um, s uh, based on a common goal uh, that they had, which was to um, enter the, the Western security and uh, political structures, namely NATO and the European Union. Um, it was also a very powerful tool for these countries. If they were able to work together, um, it would be very difficult to deny these four countries uh, an opportunity uh, to, to integrate with, Western, uh, with European structures. Um, it also was very important because it solidified this idea of what Central Europe was. Um, it was a concept that really wasn't talked about uh, following the end of the Second World War until maybe around early 1980s with Milan Kundera's uh, Tragedy of uh, Central Europe essay. Um, and it also was an illustration to the Western Europeans that this is a region that was not going to allow itself to be plunged into uh, instability and chaos, uh, which was seen uh, elsewhere following collapse of communism, such as um, the Soviet Union or, or Yugoslavia. <clears throat> so the, the aim of, uh, of the Visegrad, as I mentioned, uh, countries was to, to find themselves in, integrated into the Western structures. Um, one of the, I think, the biggest drawbacks of the Visegrad cooperation was the fact that there was no real institutionalization of the Visegrad cooperation. The only real institution that does exist is the Visegrad <coughs> Fund, um, which acts more as a grant-making institution to support, um, to support uh, social and political or social and cultural projects in Visegrad countries. But it does not work uh, on policies or advancing uh, political uh, agendas. Um, so what it has shown is that the Visegrad group can work very effectively uh, if there is a convergence and a consensus on, uh, on goals. And uh, that was the case coming into 2004 with the accession to the European Union. After 2004, the question then came is what now of the Visegrad, what should, uh, what should happen? Well, immediately in May already of 2004, following accession, uh, the countries uh, came together and uh, redeclared and reaffirmed that Visegrad cooperation would continue. Um, that they will work on regional initiatives, um, focus on, on, on voting together as one voice within inside the European Union. And uh, it's also important to remember that at that time, 2004 was right, at, right after the Orange Revolution or during the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, after the Rose Revolution in Georgia. Um, and there was a belief that Eastern Europe, post-Soviet space, was soon going to become the next area of, of Western integration, of integration into, into, into European structures. And Central Europe, already having gone through that process, um, was going to play a key leading role uh, in this. And so here we fast forward now five years later to 2009. Um, this was the launch of the European Union's Eastern Partnership Project. It was not a Visegrad initiative, but it was launched and led by Sweden and Poland. Um, and for the first time, you have a Central European state which was leading a foreign policy initiative of the European Union. So it kind of reaffirmed this idea that Central Europe is going to be involved in um, in 
uh, Eastern European Affairs, and, and it was launched at, in Prague in 2009. So now we can fast forward a little bit, um, a few more years later, to November, December 2013, um, when we have seen uh, what has taken place uh, in, in Kiev, in the Maidan. Um, overall, the response by the Visegrad countries uh, when the Ukraine crisis was in strictly an internally focused crisis uh, was uh, generally unified. Um, as early as December 13, 2013, uh, the Visegrad countries had, had uh, released joint statements condemning uh, the crackdown on the protesters um, and, and, and called on the European Union to lead efforts uh, to, to, uh, to diminish the, or to de-escalate the tensions taking place in Kiev. Um, Poland, uh, by no surprise, was, was one of the leading voices uh, supporting the, uh, the revolution in, in Kiev. Um, and the foreign minister at that time, Jarosław Sikorski, um, as we all know, led uh, the famous delegation, um, along with uh, French and German foreign ministers, to meet with uh, Viktor Yanukovych and the protesters to negotiate some sort of settlement to the crisis. And then we know what happened after that with, uh, with uh, Yanukovych almost immediately fleeing. Um, and the crisis turning into a, a new phase. But at the time of the revolution also, I, I would say that we've seen that the Czechs were also very uh, vocal in their solidarity with the Ukrainians that were protesting on the Maidan. Um, and uh, Slovaks and Hungarians as well were uh, on the same page with, with the European Union. Here we have, this is a picture of uh, the signing ceremony of the annexation of Crimea into the Russian Federation. And this was probably in the beginning um, in March 2014 is when the, the crisis went from being an internal Ukrainian crisis to a much more external and problematic crisis for Central Europe. Um, the Visegrad countries found it very difficult to find a common response to the unfolding crisis and the broader challenges posed uh, by, by Russia and its policies. Um, despite the fact that the region itself has a shared history and a memory of Soviet rule, I think it's not, it's, it's enough to look at um, 1956 in Hungary, 68 in Czechoslovakia, 81 in Poland, um, and to add that together with just the shared history of working together as the Visegrad countries to achieve the goals to get into NATO and the European Union as I just outlined, you would assume that a unanimous uh, position and consensus on the situation would, uh, would take place. But uh, unfortunately that was not the case, and instead we have seen um, diverging policies and public opinions uh, emerge uh, on uh, attitudes towards, uh, towards the situation. So I want to briefly look a little bit. Um, it was very difficult to find data that would uh, com be compatible and at the same time be timely. Um, but I tried to get a, a little bit of an insight of public opinion and attitudes towards the situation. Um, and I'll start with Poland. Uh, this is from February 20, 2015. The, um, in Poland, 76% of Poles have stated that they are interested in the situation in Ukraine, which is over three-fourths of the people. Poland is also a very large country, but naturally Poland is, uh, is probably geographically the closest and shares a border with Russia in the north. With Kaliningrad, the security uh, situation and security concerns are also very much on top of the minds of Poles, where we have 75% <coughs> believe that the situation directly affects security of Poland. And 56% of Poles um, said that they support Ukraine's pro-European uh, efforts. I was able to find a similar type of data for Czech Republic, um, and it already shows uh, this contrast of, of attitudes towards uh, the situation. Now, 47% had said that they're interested in the situation taking place in Ukraine, um, which is less than half, as opposed to Poland. 61% uh, said that they also believe that the situation directly affects their security. So again, a strong element and concern about security uh, in the region. Um, and 35% of Czechs said that they believe that their country should support Ukraine's uh, pro-European efforts. <clears throat> um, looking at Slovak attitudes, I was able to get data from October 2014. Um, and here, it's a little older, but uh, it, again, it's similar to a little bit of what we saw taking place in Czech Republic. Um, Forty-five percent uh, said that they they support European integration of Ukraine, um, but uh, astonishingly, forty-nine percent of Slovaks stated that the EU should not punish Russia for uh, for its actions. So you have a 50-50 split 
within the society on how to take action against, uh, if or whether or not to take action against Russia. 86% um, at the same time believe that Ukraine is an independent state and support its territorial unity. Lastly, Hungary, which was extremely difficult, uh, if there is any more recent data, I appreciate any source, uh, was not able to find anything uh, newer than April 2014, but uh, it does give us a little bit of insight into attitudes, I think. 31% uh, during, in, from this survey agreed that Hungary should do everything possible to support Ukraine and its people. Uh, um, this is one third compared to what we were seeing in Poland. Um, uh, again, a similar amount uh, support the sanctions against Russia, while half uh, believe that Hungary should just stay out of what is happening uh, in Ukraine. So what divides and what unites? Well, um, since the onset of Russia's aggressive foreign policy in Ukraine, we've seen a series of divergent policies uh, towards the situation. Um, Poland uh, obviously has taken a much more hawkish approach to the situation, uh, while uh, Prague, Budapest, and uh, Bratislava have all uh, voiced doubts about the effectiveness of sanctions and also concerns about uh, economic fallout for their own economies because of sanctions in Russia. Um, <clears throat> so outside of Poland, I would say a much more pragmatic approach is probably being taken taking place in the Central European countries of uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, and Hungary. Um, uh, much more economic interests are involved, um, and, uh, but at the same time, they're not undermining EU policy and still supporting uh, EU uh, policy, joint policies. Uh, Slovakia uh, is an interesting example because you have, on the one hand, the Prime Minister, um, Robert Fico, who uh, has come out with some very pro-Russian statements, um, pro-Putin statements, but at the same time, you have this policy uh, that Slovakia instituted of the reverse gas flow um, to support uh, energy to, to Ukraine, which can be seen as one of the most anti-Russian policies coming out of the region. So it's kind of almost this kind of confusion um, or, or maybe a delicate balance uh, between having to keep good relations with, uh, with Russia, but also um, being in line and supporting Ukraine at the same time. <coughs> situation has absolutely been a, a, a challenge for Central Europe, um, and I think the idea of the region as, as a unified whole, um, it's uh, the, the unity and the cohesiveness that we saw during the Visegrad cooperation um, has severely been diminished as a result of what has taken place uh, in Ukraine. Um, overall, the policies, uh, with the exception of Poland, the policies have been much more pragmatic, focused on, on economics. Um, and, this, and, uh, and the role of Russian propaganda is, is, is playing there as well. Um, so I guess I just want to leave, leave off with the remark that not only uh, has the Ukraine crisis challenged Central Europe, um, which was the topic of my, my discussion, but it's also a reflection of how it has challenged Europe as a whole. Uh, and uh, and, a, and a, re a true resolution to the crisis is, is going to require not only a united Central Europe, but a united Europe in this situation, and I think the real test, first, the real first test that we're going to see will be in June uh, when the European Union needs to decide on um, sanctions, whether or not to renew or, or to cancel. So, thank you very much. Uh, that it could be also lessons learned uh, from history because I took uh, the topic of the conference very seriously uh, about historical parallels. And Ambassador Eichtinger mentioned that we commemorate uh, several anniversaries now, especially in uh, Vienna, and uh, we paid attention uh, mostly uh, to two of them. Uh, one, of course, is uh, 1914, and the other one is 1815. Uh, was uh, we looked at the idea, and the thesis uh, of the democratic peace. So what does a democratic peace thesis say? It says democracies don't uh, wage war against democracies, which is a really strong empirical law. We don't really know about the causalities between democracy and peace. So most authors refer to Immanuel Kant, to his eternal uh, peace of uh, the republics. Uh, the causality is still debated. But it's a strong, even empirical uh, fact uh, uh, already. So was it that um, most of the participating states in the war 
did not qualify as uh, democracies. Some did, uh, others did not. Of course, democracies do fight wars. So we had the colonial powers, Great Britain, France, uh, we have Israel, we have the United States. They do fight war, but they don't fight war against each, each other. So that might be one explanation why the border collapsed. It cannot be, some would say, it's uh, in interdependence, economic <coughs> interdependence would keep uh, peace. Before the First World War, we had a pretty strong interdependence between the, uh, among the later war fighting uh, parties. So it was high trade, uh, no passports uh, necessary, and there was this famous author, Norman Angel, who wrote a book. Uh, before the First World War, the uh, First World War, a world war between these powers uh, would be stupid, cat catastrophic. Uh, he did not say, as now we are explaining, that he said uh, a, a world war uh, was impossible. He said it would be possible, but it would be a catastrophic. But there was high you know, interdependence uh, between the states. Um, of course, a confirmation of this democratic peace theory would be that after 1918, uh, no democratic uh, order emerged. That was some um, attempts, institutional attempts with the League of Nations to prevent a further development towards the World War. League of Nations has been failed, and also democracy failed uh, uh, once more. Again, we had uh, bipolarity. So we know the history, and uh, we know there was the occupation of the Red Army of the East European, sta East European States. Uh, and then we have uh, simultaneous, we have containment, roll back, uh, we have this uh, arms race, we have the proxy wars in, in third world countries, we have this very dangerous crisis from Berlin 1, Berlin 2, uh, uh, Cuba. Uh, but we also had a debate <coughs> in Austria and I say so um, about neutrality. So it was not only about Austrian neutrality. <coughs> Austria got its neutrality again, 60 years anniversary now, in 1955. And uh, it was, some say, neutrality is linked to bipolarity or to the blocks. No, neutrality is the exemption of the block, blocks. Uh, Neutrality is an anomaly uh, of the cold uh, of the cold war. So neutral states managed to escape the block building process. So what is less known is that uh, in the 50s, in the late 50s, uh, so that was not only Stalin's note about Germany in <coughs> 52. In the late 50s, we had a heavy debate in Central Europe about disengagement and uh, neutrality. Somehow it was linked to the German questions, of course, uh, but it was uh, not only uh, communists who would think about it. Uh, of course, there were strong contributions by uh, the senators Humphrey, Noland, made in this 56, 57, but also by the uh, leader of the British Labour Party, Geitzkel, uh, made strong suggestions in this uh, uh, direction, disengagement. So their suggestion was German unification did not work as Adenauer suggested uh, uh, in uh, 46, 47. Uh, it did not work after 10 years, uh, so we have to try something else means a uh, neutral zone in Central U uh, Europe and also the East European states should leave the Warsaw Pact uh, at the same time. Disengagement is was, that was linked to uh, uh, nuclear weapon free zone, the, that's more, more known here, the Arapatsky plan, so it was special focus on this uh, kind of thing, it is, uh, engagement, uh, disengagement. Uh, of course, uh, German Chancellor Adenauer was very much opposed to it, and he was opposed to Austrian neutrality because he says, I suspected it was a, a Soviet conspiracy against Germany if Austria becomes neutral. 
So uh, Germany, uh, it might uh, model for Germany uh, uh, as well. But it turned out that Austria did not become a communist country, ne neither did uh, Finland. Um, so uh, after 55, Austria immediately adopted Western values, joined the United Nations. Uh, why I'm saying this here, so I'll just make a small remark. I do, and that might be controversial here now. Uh, for the Ukraine, I do see only two solutions now. Either it becomes a neutral state uh, like Austria and keep its territorial integrity and sovereignty, or it becomes a divided state like, state, uh, like uh, Germany. So that, these are the, basically the two options. I know there will be some uh, 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 opposition here. Uh, so let me move on before I come to the lessons learned uh, very briefly to the present uh, world order. Otherwise, I cannot talk about the lessons learned for the present world order. So, uh, the present world order, of course, is very much, uh, very much based on the Westphalian system of the uh, system of the uh, 1648. So the modern state system emerged. Uh, 48, and when you read Kissinger's latest book about world order, he strongly supports this Westphalian uh, 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 system. I would compare, combine it with the uh, uh, definition uh, of Max Weber's state, that the state has the uh, monopoly, uh, the legitimate monopoly of the uh, use of force. Otherwise, there would be a uh, privatization of violence. And what we see now, not only in the Middle East, in uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, Yemen, uh, North Africa, <coughs> Libya, but we see it also in Eastern Europe, in the Ukraine, that non-state actors are emerging and challenging uh, the state. So the best feeling order and the Max Weber state is challenged uh, now. And this, is, this, I do think, is uh, a danger uh, for stability. And at this point, I do not agree with uh, Professor Erkrit in the morning lecture. He said, a uh, nation state is a thing of the past, and we have to look more on the uh, regions and non-state actors. I do think that would be uh, very dangerous. Uh, second, uh, uh, the hegemonic, hegemonic uh, border is collapsing as well. So we thought for a while the United States would guarantee order uh, in the Middle East, in Asia, but also in Europe, in Africa. The United States is not going to do this. So in the media you hear the phrase world police, or it's world police, it's not the correct phrase, but the US cannot keep uh, stability uh, in the world uh, anymore. What can we learn? Uh, one is, of course, a new concept of power uh, would be possible. A new concept of power that can be applied globally, uh, but also uh, regionally. Okay? Uh, that means cooperation, at the same time establishing some uh, uh, balance of power. Roosevelt tried it after 45, somehow a cooperation among the big powers. It failed because bipolarity came. Interdependence can keep uh, peace, not always, as we have seen in the first world war, but it can uh, uh, keep peace. And if a new world order emerges based on common rules, standards, uh, norms, uh, and principles, it might have. So I will not just briefly mention the new big uh, free trade agreements, uh, which are uh, now negotiated with TTIP, transatlantic. Created investment partnerships, the, the TPP, the Trans Pacific uh, Partnership. They can set common standards, norms, and rules. And the hope would be from this liberal <coughs> institution that is eventually they would integrate and not isolate China and also Russia by sucking this uh, uh, state. So, an ideal. One sentence, ten seconds. An ideal, an ideal world order would be what we don't have. A, a effective international organizations, together with interdependence, based on the concept of power, 
uh, uh, mainly uh, consisting of uh, democracies uh, and uh, the uh, and on, on the uh, Westphalian uh, state uh, state order. Uh, of course, we don't have this, but this should be the aim uh, that we are striving for. And, uh, for. and as a political scientist, we have to look at all these concepts uh, for uh, stability, not only in Central Europe, but also globally. Thank you.